This is Kenyon College Television. Welcome to Kenyon College Television News for the week of January 29, 1990. KCTV News is a weekly news program highlighting Kenyon news and events. I'm Brennan Keefe. And I'm Ed Curtis. Our top story, Five Step, the program which assists students interested in the profession of teaching, will be closing at the end of this academic year. The decision made by senior staff members of the administration has surprised and angered many members of the Kenyan community. I filed this story earlier. In 1984, Kenyon received a grant from the Department of Education's FIPSI, Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Education, to begin the five-step program. Jane Rutkoff, who has been director from the project's beginning, has counseled several Kenyan students as they have sought degrees in teaching at Columbia and Tufts universities, among other innovative graduate schools. At present, approximately 20 Kenyan students are now seeking such degrees. Last year, Director Rutkoff oversaw 50 volunteer jobs for enrolled Kenyan students at local public schools. And this year, she has coordinated the participation of 10 Kenyan students in externships with exemplary members of the teaching profession. Yet shortly before Thanksgiving break, Jane Rutkoff received a phone call from Academic Dean Ann Ponder, who informed her that Five Step would be shutting its doors at the end of this academic year. The decision to close the office was announced at a Monday, January 22nd meeting of the faculty. Several members of the faculty were not pleased, among them Professor of History Will Scott. It was a program that allowed us to help students go to the best possible education programs in the country, but at no expense to the college except for the cost of five steps. So for the cost of one professor, we in effect got a major. And it seems to me it is important that our students have that option available. And five step gave us that option and it gave it to us relatively inexpensively. Now, Oddly enough, in a recent $35 million capital campaign ran by the development office, $800,000 was requested to run the college's special programs, including Five Step. And in an accompanying letter to that solicitation, President Philip Jordan wrote, quote, Programmatic innovations have also recently enlarged the options available to Kenyan students. Among them is the pioneering Five Step, end quote. Uh, the director of Five Step and uh, her staff uh, were aware that uh, the program for its entire time at Kenyon has been uh, funded externally uh, the, uh, on soft money and that a decision 
would be made in the current year about whether it would be continued in that particular form or not. So part of the decision, part of the reason why this year is the timing of this year. The funding will be up at the end of this particular year and a decision about whether to bring all of that cost on budget, those positions uh, within the college uh, in a way that they had not been before uh, was part of the issue before senior staff. Though the director of Five Step, Jane Rutkoff, wouldn't appear on camera, she did grant KCTV an interview. In it, she said, quote, I am profoundly distressed. Five Step at Kenyon was a success, attracting good students to the teaching profession. Our reputation went beyond just the Kenyon community, so much so that students from other GLCA colleges sought our advice, end quote. Could you tell me how Kenyon uh, now plans to accommodate the needs of those students interested in a career in education? We intend to ask a faculty member to serve as the pre-professional advisor in education in the way that we have a faculty member serving as a pre-law or pre-med or pre-engineering advisor. That would be one member of the team that we're proposing. Actually, we have a current working name for this team, too. Uh, advice for pre-college teaching called APT. Uh, we hope that the, uh, uh, that the Faculty Committee on Advising and Standards and that the students we hope to talk with uh, will think that that is a nifty name uh, to help name this particular team. The decision to close the five-step office comes in the midst of a national shortage of good elementary and secondary school teachers. While the college insists that it is committed to relieving the shortage, those students who would fill that need will have to do it without the resources of Five Step. I'm Ed Curtis outside of Ackland House, KCTV. Recently, the Health and Counseling Center has been the target of criticism from the Kenyan community. Many students have complained that the center is overcrowded, possibly resulting from a shortage of staff members. Our own Colin Parker joins us now in the studio. Welcome, Colin. Thank you. Colin, I know I've been over to the Health and Counseling Center for a big, long wait. Uh, what's, the, what's the problem? Do they need another doctor over there? Uh, well, basically, I, I talked to Dr. Shermer, who's the director of the center, and uh, he said it's really a combination of problems. Uh, first of all, they do have some financial difficulty with not quite the budget that they would like to have. And also, there's a shortage of rooms. They only have two examining rooms as mm -hmm. opposed to many others that they would like to have. This is the story that I filed. The Kenyon College Health and Counseling Center has long been the building on campus for students to run to in time of sickness. Recently, though, concerns have arisen as to whether or not the staff of the health center is able to adequately treat the average of 60 students per day that enter through their doors. I talked recently with the director of the center, Dr. Tracy Shermer, about the problem of overcrowding. Many students have complained about the fact that they might have to wait in line or the fact that the Health and Counseling Center is so overcrowded. Um, do you see any way to alleviate this problem? Now, we're looking at possible remedies. Um, it's true. Um, years ago when we first started, there were about a um, little over 2,000 students, meaning that means student visits, uh, were cared for here at the Health and Counseling Center. Um, last year there was close to 10,000. Um, the amount of utilization that we have has increased. The services that are rendered in the nine years that I've been here have increased exponentially. Uh, full gynecological care is rendered here. We uh, treat trauma, we treat athletic injuries right here on the facility. Uh, With all these responsibilities on campus, plus the added task of being a physician at the Knox Community Hospital, Dr. Shermer is constantly making an effort to ensure the efficiency of the Health and Counseling Center. However, backups often occur. Well, most students find that they want to be able to come up and be seen right when they're sick. Mm -hmm. We would like to be able to do that, and we try. But many times, there's complicating factors, such as 12 people show up at 8.30 in the morning or at 1 o'clock in the afternoon to be seen starting about 1 in the morning at 9 o'clock and starting to be seen sometimes at, at 1.30 in the afternoon. The reason for the delay is to do the triage and the clearing of things, also for me to make phone calls. Many people have blamed the overcrowding on the lack of floor space in the center. In the current building, there are only two examining rooms. Consequently, Dr. Shermer has occasionally had to meet with patients in his office 
or even in the triage or screening room. I asked him about possible solutions to this problem. The answer isn't simple. You know, I've often looked at the, at the situation as if um, we had a better triage system, um, if we had a cold clinic, but the facility here, the limited space in the waiting room, wouldn't allow the privacy of a cold clinic, if we had more examining rooms, um, if I had some day beds to put ill students down so that they don't take up an examining room, just put them down, let them sleep there, stay there, we can give them fluids, the nurses could check on them periodically, I could go back and see them only for a few seconds just to make sure the temperature comes down mm -hmm. or the pain hasn't changed. Many students have suggested perhaps adding a physician to the staff of the Health and Counseling Center. Dr. Shermer, however, believes that this would not be a feasible solution. Students say, what about another physician? Well, first of all, the population probably couldn't accommodate another physician very well. The facility could not at all. In some ways, it, one could think it could on a part-time basis, meaning that when I'm at all these meetings or trying to take care of these things, maybe a physician could come in and cover or spell for a while. But getting a physician to come up to the area to do that would be very difficult. And financially, we'd have to take a close look at where that could be better spent. While financial difficulty and limited space contribute to the problem of overcrowding at the Health and Counseling Center, the staff is continuing to search for solutions. People are seen, though. If you come up to be seen, you may wait, but you're going to be seen that same day. If you want to schedule an appointment, then you can call and schedule an appointment to be seen. However, please remember that students that are very sick will be squeezed in, even on those appointment days, to be seen, because we're trying to respond to everybody's needs. So, despite many concerns from around the Kenyan community, Dr. Shermer assures that any student who requires medical assistance will receive it. Colin Parker, KCTV News, at the Health and Counseling Center. Last semester, Kenyon College, along with 19 other elite private educational institutions, was named in a Justice Department antitrust investigation. The investigation is in response to allegations made by the Washington Post that colleges are, quote, unfairly restraining trade and setting similar levels of tuition and financial aid, end quote. Many colleges have admitted to this long-standing practice, saying that it is necessary to avoid bidding wars in which the most desirable students are lured by scholarship offers. Although the investigation is in its preliminary stages, the Justice Department has already requested and received tuition and financial aid information from Kenyon. I will have an in-depth story on Kenyon's side of the price-fixing investigation next week. Have deans been spotted in your dorm? Well, there's no need to call the exterminator. The deans have instituted a program that they will run for the next few months called Deans in the Dorms. In it, they meet with students on their own turf, so to speak, to discuss the commission report, as well as other concerns that students might be having. This goodwill gesture is meant to show the administration's regard for students' opinions about life at the college. With us now in the studio is KCTV News swimming correspondent, Nate Lorandi. Welcome to the studio, Nate. Thank you, Brendan. Um, so the Lords and the Ladies had their last home meet uh, last weekend. How'd it go? It went very well. The Lords won a close match against Oakland, and the Ladies uh, fell a little short of a victory. Oakland's a very tough Division II team, and they have a good chance of winning nationals mm -hmm. this year. Do you think the Lords and Ladies will repeat this year and uh, will have another uh, Kenyan uh, swimming victory? Well, based on the performances of both teams against Oakland, um, I believe that both teams have a great chance of repeating their national victories, especially due to the cohesiveness that is apparent in both teams right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and uh, show a little footage and uh, some other information on this week's, on this week's uh, meet. Friday, January 26th, the Lords and Ladies swam against top Division II team Oakland University. While the Lords won a close match, the ladies fell a few points short of victory. Both teams had a strong showing, including some standout performances by Parker Nash in the 500 free, Eric Chambers in the 100 backstroke, Sean Kelly in the 200 butterfly, Jennifer Carter in the 200 backstroke, and Christy Stacy in the 200 butterfly. Responding to the question of how the Lords and ladies will fare at Division III Nationals, Carl Slatoff stated confidently that both teams could repeat as national champions. Both swim meets were typified by extremely close, competitive races. Individual winners for the men included Dave Wentz in the 200 free, 500 free, Sean Kelly in the 200 fly, and myself in the 400 IM and 200 breaststroke. For the women, Jennifer Carter won the 200 backstroke, 
and Christy Stacy won the 200 butterfly. Again, the lords and ladies both promise a great ending to a great season. For Kenyan Swimming and KCTV, this is Nate LaRondi signing off from the Ernst Sports Center. And now KCTV presents On the Hill, a point-counterpoint discussion with Bill O'Hearn and John Grant. Thank you. I'm Bill O'Hearn. And I'm John Grant. We'd like to welcome you today to On the Hill, a point-counterpoint discussion of issues currently affecting the Kenyan community. Today we're going to be discussing gender studies. John, perceptions in the community exist that many interdisciplinary courses, especially the gender studies courses, lack integrity in their instruction and legitimacy due to events surrounding their uh, initiation in the, into the curriculum. Perhaps one of the most criti critical voices regarding the gender studies inclusion has been Professor Short, who is well known in the philosophy department and wrote an article recently in the National Review. In that article, uh, Professor Short criticized um, Rin Edwards' course on linguistics, um, discussing her qualifications as a biology instructor and not a, uh, a uh, linguistics specialist. Many are puzzled by the fact that a biology professor has made a foray into uh, linguistics. Um, but on the other hand, the integrity of Professor Broad's um, courses in gender studies has not been questioned and uh, you know he's, he's well thought of and you know the courses are said to be well uh, well instructed yet the entire movement to include gender studies in the curriculum uh, still has cast a delegitimizing de shadow over the program professor short's revelations of ideological struggle and fear among faculty is worrisome more troubling still is the virtual silence regarding the situation in the campus community. I mean, you've heard grumblings about it. I have, too. Um, people are saying that too many departments uh, lack, um, you know, the number of professors they need to teach the subjects we've had here at Kenyon for a long time well. And the fact that, you know, we need, uh, you know, to apply ourselves more to the courses we've had before. And we're adding all these um, uh, interdisciplinary courses. And on, the intellectual, on an intellectual level, uh, there still smolders a heated argument as to whether or not there is legitimate basis for gender studies as a program on its own. So, you know, in introducing our, our subject, I, I think many people today um, still see the gender studies program as a result of a small group of faculty who are advocating women's studies at Kenyon um, rather than a real gender studies program. And gender studies emerged as a, as a program that was devised to meet their original ends. Um, what do you think? Bill, first off, I'd like to thank you for your legal brief introduction. And I'd just like to recall the words that you uh, said at the last forum on the Commission of Student Life. Um, at that time, you stood up and you said, you know, we need to go for broke here at Kenyon. We need to find a way to get everything we want, um, whether we, you know, and try to find the money. And now you're saying, well, the problem here is that it's costing too much money to bring something like gender studies to Kenyon. Um, I'm having a problem with, with your argument. I mean, you know, one night you're a free spending liberal and the next night you're a fiscal conservative. What I'd like to say though, I'd like to get down to the brass tacks of what gender studies is. I'd like to say that basically those, who, those individuals who attack gender studies seem to feel as if gender studies is somehow attacking the old style system of education that we have here at Kenyon. And you take courses in the humanities and you study, you know, great philosophers, you take foreign languages, you study art, whatever. Um, and basically, for some members of the staff here, um, they want to, these individuals want to draw upon these the traditions which have existed in Western society for 2,000 years. Well, in a sense, that fine, that's fine, but the quadrivium went out with, you know, ancient Greece. Um, gender studies, in a sense, first of all, is not women's studies. I think I need to make that point clear. Gender studies is basically a new method of looking at things. It's basically looking at how men and women relate within a society, how, how values are defined, how things, you know, in a consumer sense, how things might be sold to women, how, you know, as a specific example. Um, it's, it's not just, you know, studying women, and 
to prove my point, you know, Professor Broad is teaching a course this, this semester entitled Men and Masculinities. Um, those who would attack gender studies, I think, first of all, uh, I would pose this question, and I'm posing it to you right now. The furthest extent to the argument against gender studies, I feel, would be that we need to get back to the old values we used to have in education. Well, that's fine. So then I say this, Bill, why don't we take Plato out of the political science department, send him back to the classics department, and teach him in his original <laughs> language? Now, now, John, John, I think, I, think, I think you're misunderstanding my point. I would like things to be ideal here at Kenyon, but I believe that uh, there is a perception and there's a strong disagreement among faculty, and it's there with the students too, that gender studies um, isn't all that it should be, that it actually has, along with other interdisciplinary movements, become victim studies. How would you respond to that, and how would you respond to the divisiveness that's in the faculty on these issues? Well, I think that Professor Short, I believe, is the person who, who used that term victim studies. And um, I think that he's trying to put a negative connotation on that, and I, I think unjustly so. For example, would we say that blacks were victims and that we shouldn't be studying what happened during the Civil Rights Movement because that was basi that's basically victim studies? Do we need I to study that alone as an interdisciplinary course, or should that be history? I mean, my feeling on the issue is this, that there is divisiveness, and we need to talk about these things, and there's no way that you and I here together are going to get through all the issues. Granted. But we must get this issue into the open, because if there is a, a festering blister of um, disenchantment within the faculty regarding these issues, we must open up the situation. I think it's time for the Listen, faculty to the get faculty, open on this issue. The faculty disagrees about just, a, just about everything. Um, I'd like to get back to a point that you raised because um, I, I think that you are saying that basically these gender studies people are guilty of kind of a, a reverse McCarthyism. They are, by fostering a fear of climate, uh, by fostering a climate of fear and intimidation, certain faculty seem to be debilitating their own cause for the legitimacy of their course and seem to be missing the points of the practical criticism I'm lobbying here today. That's interesting, Bill, because basically what you're saying is that liberals are some, have somehow gained control of Kenyon, and, and basically there's this witch hunt against those, profess those conservative professors who would oppose gender studies. I don't think studies. I'm saying that today, but I, I think we're probably out of time. Thanks for joining us this week on On the Hill. I'm Bill O'Hearn. And I'm John Grant. Next week, the issue will be housing, fairness or folly. How many times have you been to the library to check out materials and were not permitted to simply because you didn't have a Kenyan student ID? It seems that even a passport, a driver's license, and even possibly a note from your mother just is simply not enough to prove your identity as a Kenyan student. KCTV reporter Karen Devine takes a lighthearted look at student frustrations with the library. In the words of a fellow Kenyan student, if this is reality, and this is LSD. This is the library. Come with us now as we attempt to explore the world of Olin. Upon entering the library, we first reach the atrium. Designed to be an open, comfortable place for students to take a break from studying, the atrium also provides the perfect opportunity for students wishing to take part in lively intellectual discussions. Let's see what this group here is talking about. Julia? Hi. Well, actually, I came here quite a while ago, I guess. Um, but Perry it made me talk to him, and I <laughs> have been procrastinating. So, uh, <laughs> so have you been discussing some class here? A class? Uh -huh. <laughs> actually, I was just saying, um, you know how much I could, I could really dig a Coke right now? I wonder if they've ever thought about putting vending machines down here in the atrium. I'm not sure. Hey, listen up, guys. It's 10 15. Let's get rocking. Come on. Oh, let's go. Come on. Come on. Inside the library, we find various types of studiers. The so called social studiers usually choose these green chairs. Rumor has it that many have mastered a technique that enables them to watch who's entering or exiting the library, who's in the atrium, and who's circling either level of the fishbowl, all while appearing to be hard at work. If one desires an interruption-free area for intense reading, he or she would probably choose the circular tower rooms. The dungeon-like basement 
is unofficially reserved for seniors studying for, what else, comps. Whatever you're working on, if you have trouble locating any of the library's vast resources, you can always come here to the information desk for fast, courteous assistance. Aside from Olin Computer Center downstairs, there are numerous computers placed around the library itself. Students utilize the VAC system for various academic purposes. Karen, what are you working on here tonight? Actually, I don't do work like papers or anything. I just send mail messages. Hi. Hi. Uh, could I see the uh, psych reserve for Psych 48 on Freud? Sure. Um, can I have your ID, please? Uh, I don't have my ID right now with oh, me. I'm sorry. I can't give you the, uh, the, well, the ID. I have my license with me. Driver's license. Well, it and, doesn't, I mean, and my birth certificate. And, it's part of the rules. I can't give you and my passport. An ID. Well, I, well, I mean, I just need to look at it for a second. I, just, I have I'm an sorry. exam on it tomorrow, and I just need to look at it I'm for sorry, a second. I'm sorry, I need your ID. Oh, I I'm, don't have like, a choice. I live in the new apartments, and I know I'm it's sorry. snowing out. Listen, okay, I don't want to have to call security. I need your ID. Well, I don't have it with me right now. It's all the way back, and I don't even know exactly where it is. I just, look, I'll stand right here, and I'll read it. I won't even, like, turn around, and... I and need your ID. Look, I'll give you 20 bucks. Just, you can, like, hold the 20 bucks while I'm reading it. All this talk about the library has reminded me that I have a lot of work to do. Wait a minute. Come back here. What are you doing? No, I just, I thought I just checked it out. No, but that doesn't matter. I have to, you're trying to steal one of our books. I don't think you really checked it out. I don't believe you. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's it's my fault. Uh, um, there you go. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Indeed, the library sometimes seems more baffling than helpful. Nonetheless, it remains a popular spot for hundreds of Kenyan students. This is Karen Devine for KCTV. Ed, rumor has it that Jesse Jackson will be visiting the campus on April 26th. That's right, Brennan. Uh, April 26th, common hour. Uh, he'll be in Ross Hall, and I think that Frank Hale of the Office of Multicultural Affairs is arranging that visit. Do you have any idea how the uh, college was able to uh, book such a, a national political figure as Jesse Jackson? I think it's Frank Hale's reputation nationally. Uh, he appears in a lot of publications like Black Studies and is vice provost at Ohio State University, so he has some connections. Mm -hmm. And in fact, KCTV will keep you informed on upcoming broadcasts about Jesse Jackson's visit in the near future. If you would like your event covered by KCTV or would like to suggest story ideas, you can reach KCTV at PBX 5837 or through computer mail on the Academic Vax Network. You can also write to KCTV at P.O. Box 1638, Gambier, Ohio, 43022. Well, that's all the news we have for you this week. You can catch KCTV news next week in the shops all through lunch, also in the Pierce Lounge at dinner at 5 and at 6 p.m., and in the auditorium in the Olin Library two showings, 7 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Also, this edition of KCTV News will be on reserve in the Olin Library AV Viewing and Listening Room starting tomorrow. That's the news from around the hill. For all of us here at the station, have a good week.